Welcome to Sightseeing Japan, the podcast where we explore the land of love. I'm Paul Bresson. And I'm Jason Neeling. Wait, no sexy voice? What? And I'm Jason Neeling. Oh, you're melting my heart, bro. But I thought Paris was the land of love. Everywhere's the land of love. Well, we're not talking about everywhere. We're talking about a specific place. And a specific way of expressing your love. That's true. A physical way. Uh, which brings me to the, the very first thing I wanted to say is I want to start with this episode with a quick warning. Because today's episode is going to be a little less family friendly than most. Maybe a lot less family friendly than most. We're going to be talking about certain intimate activities that sometimes happen between two people who love each other very much. So if you have a young child that you don't want hearing that kind of stuff, now is your chance to protect their innocence. I'll give you five seconds. You make it sound so serious. That wasn't five seconds, Paul. Why? I'm not getting nasty Okay, it's been five seconds. (laughs) Now we can let loose. (laughs) What's up, Paul? You make it sound so serious. It's fair warning. But I don't know about you, but I'm not planning to go that crazy. I mean, okay, all right, hey, uh, get wild, bro. Let's let's. I plan to. Let's see where you go. Now, when we have an episode where we put out a warning like that, I feel like I need to take this opportunity to get crazy. You know? Did we even say what this episode's about yet? No, I haven't gotten there. Okay. <laughs> but another thing I want to note right at the beginning is that this episode was requested by Paul. I was going to say, <laughs> what? wait, what? <laughs> this was Paul's idea. So if anybody doesn't like this topic or the episode, if this just turns into a shit show, it's on Paul. Fair, but two counterpoints. One, Jason thought this would be a dumb idea, and I think he's changed his mind on that. So if you like this episode, think that Jason almost axed it, but thankfully Paul pushed hard enough. And made it an episode. That's fair. And two, if Jason gets all nasty, that's Jason. That's not Paul's fault. That's also fair. Just because (laughs) I suggested the topic. Yeah. (laughs) But I guess we're about to have a lot of fun, right? I hope so. It's a lighthearted topic. It's kind of one of those like unique, funny things about Japan that you wouldn't maybe expect. It is. There's some less lighthearted stuff about it, but we'll save that for the end. True, true. So yeah, let's talk about sex, Paul. I'm uncomfortable already. (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) Let's talk about penetration. (laughs) Okay, all right. I'm glad you gave a warning. (laughs) Uh, So today we're talking about love hotels, I guess. That's, That's the topic, love hotels. Yeah, I guess I should read my notes here or something. (laughs) That's okay. We can just wing this whole thing. (laughs) Have you ever been to a love hotel? No, and I'm not even sure if I've seen one. I feel like I've probably seen one, but I probably oh. didn't realize what it was. You, you, There's no way you couldn't have seen one. I don't know. You kind of got to be in certain areas. Yeah, areas you've been, <laughs> I think. Oh, well, okay, yeah. I mean, I just, I don't know. Well, let, let, me, let me get to my notes here. Okay. We should try to be academic about this for a few minutes at least, sure. I guess. So a love hotel, or uh, commonly called in Japanese, rabuho, rabuho, rabuhotel, rabuhotel. That's that's pretty good. <laughs> Something like that. Rabuho is, uh, is short. You know, they stick together love and hotel and cut off the tell. Basically, it's just a hotel that offers short stays so people can have sex. That's, that's their business model. I lived near a place like that in LA, and we just called it a motel. Was there something special about this motel that did they rent it by the hour? Is that what you yeah, saying? yeah, that was the only thing that was special oh, about it. Was, it was a nasty place that got shut down like a year or two after I moved there. You know, at a place I used to work, there was a motel right across the street that had a certain reputation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They exist in the U.S. But they're much cooler in Japan. Yeah, they definitely <laughs> are. And cleaner, probably. Yeah. So you might also see these places referred to as boutique hotels, fashion hotels, leisure hotels, amusement hotels. <laughs> <laughs> they are quite amusing. 
couples' hotels. And Paul, why is there demand for these specifically in Japan? In Japan, in a lot of houses, there's not a lot of living space. Either people sleep in the same rooms or it's a small place only separated by maybe paper walls or doors where sounds carry very easily. People are coming and going. There's just not time or place for people to be private and intimate together. Yep. You know, Paul, another thing that I was really curious about when it comes to love hotels was, are these places used for prostitution? And if so, how much? And, you know, I tried to dig into this in my research, but I had a little bit of trouble. I can only answer one of those questions for you. The first one? Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. The how much is, is very difficult to say. Yeah, which would make sense because, you know, that type of business is hard to get numbers on. Yeah. And I feel like it depended a lot on the hotel. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Sure. And I got a sense that a lot of the articles that I was reading wanted to kind of downplay the association with the sex trade. Like a lot of these places are advertised to the Western world as just like fun little novelties, like places where you can go with your significant other to kind of have a fun time. And a lot of sources didn't mention prostitution at all. Yeah. But then they give like rewards cards out. I feel like some people could rack this up real quick. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, that's it's definitely not like heavily associated publicly, at least in my my feeling I don't know. of it. Yeah, it's hard to tell. I would be interested to hear the perspective of a Japanese person how these are publicly perceived because I would bet that they're perceived differently in Japan than they are outside of Japan. Sure, but they're also widely used by the general Japanese public. So it's not like people don't go to them. Like people go to like normal people go to them. Do you have any good numbers, Jason? Like I, the best numbers I could find were kind of old from times that maybe were more peak. I've heard that's maybe slowed down a little bit. You're talking about like n how many there are. Yeah, or like the size of the industry, or how many people go a year. I'm not sure about right now, but I saw that in the heyday. In the early 2000s, there were an estimated 30,000 love hotels in Japan. Okay. So the one number I got that really blew me away is I found one source that said in 2006, there were about 37,000 love hotels, and there were 500 million visits a year to them, which was the equivalent of 1.4 million couples per day which is like 2% of the Japanese population Wow, was going to a love hotel every day. I mean, if that's the only place you can go to do that, I yeah. could see them getting a lot of business. Yeah, and there were probably people that went very regularly. Yeah, totally. You know, so I guess, yeah, you could get up to 2%. But that was apparently the heyday, the boom times. But as we'll, I think, talk about later, it's not always super clear, especially today, what's a love hotel and what's not either. So numbers get even more fudgier than that. Definitely. Uh, another thing I wanted to ask you about. How come you never ask me if I've been to a love hotel? You just assume I've probably gone to a love hotel. I would know. <laughs> We're just close enough friends that I would know. Like you would have okay. told me that. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't keep any secrets from you, bro. I know that's not true, but <laughs> nothing important. I feel like we would have talked about it. Yeah. And I know the times that you've been to Japan. I was with you for one of them. And the other one, I don't think you were with anybody. That, unless you hired somebody, which I don't know. Hey. I don't know how deep your secrets go, but I hey, don't hey. think you've. Let's not, let's not even go there. No. Right. Anyway. No, no. But that was actually where I wanted to go was. In the last episode, when we talked about one of our scary stories, I, I used the word prostitute, but I feel like I've heard that that's not politically correct anymore. Is that, am I, have you heard about that? That's probably the case. Sex worker yeah. would probably be the word. Okay. I'm going to use sex worker in this episode. Okay. But I'll try to do the same. I don't know. All the articles that I read said prostitutes, but... It's the general term that's used. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway. 
Love hotels are so prevalent in Japanese society that there's a love hotel emoji in Japan. That's true. It was somewhere in my notes. I don't remember where, but I had some details about that. I thought that was a good intro attention grabber. Yeah, it's a fun fact. It's definitely a fun one. And I actually have a lot of details about that emoji that I'm going to save for a little bit later. Okay. Okay. I always love an episode where we get to do a history section, Jason. History's good. Where do you want to start? Edo period? Early Edo period? Yeah. 17th century, let's say? Sometime around there. Okay. So this would have been the time period when the Tokugawa shogunate created these designated pleasure quarters, right, where people could find all sorts of entertainment, including those of the sexual variety. Yes. Carnal pleasures, you might say. So one type of establishment that you could find in these pleasure quarters might be inns or tea houses where you could discreetly rent a room for a short stay. So I found one source that said that these places were mostly used by sex workers and their clients, but couples would also rent rooms there. But then another source didn't even mention prostitution at all in relation to these places and focused on couples visiting together. And this is something, this is a common theme that I found in my research, is it's never clear whether these are places that are only used by or mostly used by couples, or if it's mostly the sex industry. Yeah. I heard mostly the sources I was reading were saying couples. Yeah, but, uh, I mean. But, yeah, uh, like, why do so many couples need to be discreet? Like, yeah. I guess unless you're not married yet. But Japan had different sexual norms back then, too. It's very true. In some ways, they were more open about sex. Yeah, and uh, infidelity wasn't really considered wrong by Shinto ideals. So, you know, maybe their wife is at home and they go to one of these places with their mistress or with a uh, sex worker. Yeah. But eventually these tea houses were replaced by a couple different types of places called machiai and sobaya. The machiai were fairly simple rooms with minimal interaction from the workers. You get a room with a tatami floor and very little accessories or decorations, just something really simple where you could have some privacy. But if you go to a Sobia, it was a Japanese noodle shop, Soba, with rooms to rent. So I heard this was like less likely for couples to use, and this was maybe more common for sex workers. Yeah, I saw that. Meet in the noodle shop and then sneak away. I saw that too. But the source that I thought seemed most credible said that both machiai and sobaya were not commonly used by couples. They were mostly for prostitution. Okay. And I thought this was kind of funny. You know, if you're going to a sobaya, a noodle shop for this type of thing, you might think, well, how do I know if this is a normal soba shop or if they offer that kind of service and apparently that was a problem so at some point soba shops that didn't offer other services started to put up signs saying real soba shop this is just a soba shop we just sell noodles yeah <laughs> thought that was funny yeah oh man imagine being a straight soba shop and like people come in and like hey Where's the Don't girls? even waggle Where's your eyebrows at? at me like that, Paul. This is a normal <laughs> soba shop, okay? Get out of here. You're filthy. <laughs> anyway, so like I said, I think that these places were mostly used for prostitution. Yeah. So where did normal couples go for the most part? The public park. <laughs> yeah. I saw that by the early 1900s, like that was... Just a common thing. People would go have sex outdoors in public parks. And apparently it became so much of a problem. People would like find used condoms everywhere and stuff. It's just gross. Yeah. You don't want to go for a stroll in the public park and see all these condoms everywhere. I even saw the Imperial Palace grounds and Inokashira Park were specific popular places for outdoor sex. 
So if you've been to either of those places, now you have that in your head. There you go. I guess that's what people were doing before there were police running around telling you not to. Because yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, I'm not, not like I've never seen something like that at a public park, but they usually get run out of there pretty quick, right? Here, at least, these days. It depends where. You know, I lived in Boston, right? The Fens heard some crazy stories about people stumbling upon certain things happening in the Fens. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure I myself have seen a, a condom like back in the reeds in the yeah. Fens. Yeah. Yeah. What were you doing back in the reeds in the Fens, Dude, bro? Dude, during the day, the Fens are fine. They're, it's just like a nice public park kind of area. Okay. It's I only just, ever heard about all these horror stories about the night. So I thought it was a place no one ever went. No, during the day, there's like a playground at the Fens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then at night, it just gets <laughs> wild. Well, you would think that it's only at nighttime, but I actually heard from a guy that I worked for. I was an intern for this guy that told me he walked into the fence one day and he saw a man standing there naked with another guy on his knees in front of him doing some stuff in broad daylight. There's a playground there. What are they doing? The fence is a big area. I'm sure they weren't like right by the playground. Oh, but man. Just anyway. a clear sight of the path. Yeah. All right. People gonna be people. Yeah, and people are gross. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so in the 1930s, to curb this outdoor sex problem, places called Enshuku started to appear. And these are rooms that you could rent for one yen per hour to have sex in. And this seems to be the very first love hotel type thing where actual couples would go. At least that was my conclusion based on my research. Was that before that, the rooms were mostly rented by sex workers. Couples were having sex outside. And now these were actual like love hotel type things for couples. Yeah, I almost got the impression that like kicking the people out of the park created a pressure that was solved by these places opening up. Yeah. And that's like the whole reason they existed. Totally. I also saw that at the time, bathhouses might be used for the same purpose. Okay. I saw that people liked the Enshuku because it was like a Western type design and you could like lock the door, which was like unusual in Japan and really have privacy. Okay. Uh, after World War II, the term Tsurekomi Yado was used for love hotel type places. And that translates to something like bring along in. Like I-N-N, in. So it's like an in where you can bring someone along with you. I don't know. To me, that just makes me think of like sex work. Like bring someone along. Like who you like, what did they say? Like couples hotel? Like, nah, go bring someone with you. I don't know. Maybe I'm just misinterpreting I mean, that. Or maybe it's a translation thing that well, I don't understand. I got the impression that both things were happening. Yeah, I'm sure. Places. I'm sure. Like, actually, during the American occupation of Japan, more and more of these places started popping up around Tokyo. I saw, specifically in Ueno, a lot of them popped up because there was demand for them from American soldiers. Yeah. Because American soldiers were hiring sex workers yeah. and bringing them to these places. Yeah. But in 1958, legal prostitution was abolished in Japan. So what did that do to the love hotel industry? Well, I'll tell you, prostitution doesn't go away just because you outlawed it. That's not how the world works. Instead, the industry just moves underground. So the love hotel industry actually boomed at this point because now there was nowhere else to go. So that must make you think that they were exclusively using the love hotels before that. Like they might have had brothels or other places they met, and now all those places are gone and now they're all working like individually through ads and like they have to meet somewhere else. Right. So if it caused a love hotel boom, that indicates that the sex workers were not heavily using the love hotels before that. Right. I suppose that makes sense. Interesting. I mean, I would guess that the sex industry, you know, that kind of industry just operates. However, it has to, so there were probably people that had 
places where they could do that, brothels and whatever. But yeah. then if people were working independently or whatever, yeah, then maybe they go to a yeah. It maybe went room. from half and half or whatever to everyone has to go there now. Yeah, I don't know a ton about the sex industry, honestly. So spitballing here, just going off for of research. So basically, these love hotel type places all of a sudden had a monopoly on the sex trade. And that's why there were so many of them. <laughs> but then the idea of love hotels spread even further in the 1960s, along with the idea of motels. And in the 1960s, is when the love hotels start getting really cool, you start seeing the themed rooms and the themed hotels and the really gaudy stuff. And I saw that this is when married couples really started to use them a whole lot. And they had some fun amenities in there, along with the gaudy look. They would have things like sex swings, vibrating beds, perhaps, clamshell beds, like you can, prepend, <laughs> pre- you can pretend you're Ariel from The Little Mermaid or that something. That just feels 1960s to me. <laughs> yeah. Kind of want to try it, though. I've never been on a spinning bed, a vibrating bed, a clamshell bed. I've been on a waterbed, but not with somebody else. That would be interesting, too. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever slept on a waterbed. Like, I've been on a waterbed. I don't know if I've ever slept on one. I don't remember. I feel like I might have as a kid. I feel like a family friend, you know, another family had one, and I visited and slept on one, maybe. Yeah. I don't remember. Anyway, so by 1961, there were around 2,700 Tsurekomi Yados in central Tokyo alone. And to be clear, I know I've been using the, the terms interchangeably, love hotel, tsurekomiyado, whatever. At this point, they still weren't actually called love hotels. Why is that, Paul? So the term love hotel originates from Hotel Love in Osaka, which was built in 1968. It had a big rotating sign that said Hotel Love in big neon letters. Pretty sexy. It's a great name, the Love Hotel. Like that, very descriptive. Know exactly what they're talking about. Yeah. A little on the nose, but (laughs) it gets the message across. Five years later, in 1973, a Love Hotel called the Meguro Emperor opened. This one's pretty well known because it was the first one to look like a medieval castle. Apparently, that's become a trend since that one. Yeah. To this day, there's still a bunch of love hotels in Japan, like with castle type designs. Interesting that they made it like a Western style castle, you know? Because it's fantasy and that's further removed, like even from their own history. Yeah. You can bring your white knight there. So the 1970s is also when they started getting further into almost like the real life fantasy category. You started seeing like train themed rooms pop up. And I heard this described as like living out the real world fantasy of being like some of the most intimate moments of like a Japanese person's life might be when you're crammed on a train and like you're like near someone attractive and they're like breathing on you and you're close and you can smell each other and like, but you can't do anything because you're on the train or hopefully you don't do anything because you're on the train and they're a total stranger. Some people do. But you can like rent that room and bring someone there and like live out that fantasy of like meeting a stranger on a train and like the room will like literally have like a train car built in it. So you can totally like immerse yourself in these fantasies. They started diving more into that. Pretty smart. Give people what they want. (laughs) Yep. If you hit on someone's fantasy, they will open their wallet. They won't even think about it. I think that's a fact of life. Especially if it's a sexual fantasy. Those are the most powerful ones, I would say. When it comes to getting people to spend their money. Uh, Look at the money people spend online on stuff. It's crazy. It is crazy. (laughs) So all these wacky building designs, part of the reason for this is that they couldn't openly advertise. Like they can't just say, hey, come have sex here, you know? So they had to find some other way to attract people. And they came up with all sorts of just crazy architectural ideas. 
there are places that look like they belong in ancient Greece. There's a love hotel that looks like a spaceship. So if you see a really weird looking building, and that's kind of a clue, it might be a love hotel. And they might have some really fun names. I have Dude, a list the of names. names. <laughs> the names, bro. A ponytail blowing in the wind. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess there's bronies in Japan, too. <laughs> Nonchalance. Banana and donut. Banana and donut. I think... Think about it. That might be my favorite one. <laughs> but I I don't know. It's It's really close with this other one. Okay. The Raging Tanuki's Enormous Sack. That's the best one. <laughs> That's the best one. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I saw it translated as the Raging Raccoon, and I was like, no! Yeah. A raccoon is not a Tanuki! I looked up the name in Japanese to make sure, yeah, they're talking about a Tanuki. They're talking it's lazy about it. translation. It is. Sorry, I appreciate everyone out there trying to translate their best. Yeah. Because I can't. <laughs> I don't know. Banana and donut. That feels more like lighthearted and yeah. fun but it, to me. But it's funny too if you see the picture. It's like a donut with eyes and a banana with eyes, like about to, uh, a penetration is like about to happen. Paul's putting his hands together like, like the banana the banana's about to go through the donut <laughs> hole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they're both like smiling or something. It's it's funny. It is funny. But some people aren't okay with Sexual freedom, right, Paul? There's always going to be haters. Yeah. So in 1984, there was a new law passed called the Businesses Affecting Public Morals Regulation Law. Any law that says morals in it instantly makes me suspicious. Buzzkills. Always. These no, morality it's, people. It's not necessarily a bad thing to regulate the sex industry in some ways. Yeah. But what, it, what, did, what just, did this law lead just to? Just don't impress your idea of morality on other people. Right, exactly, exactly. Anyway, so yeah, this law basically gave police jurisdiction over love hotels. And because of this, new love hotels that popped up wanted to distance themselves from this love hotel classification. So they started designing their facilities more conservatively. Yeah. So all these crazy like spaceship hotels, castle hotels, you see less of that these days, though they're still around, mm -hmm. but they're, they're much more subtle. Yeah. Also around the 1980s, love hotels started to be marketed more towards women. And I didn't find a lot of details like explaining why, but my guess is that women are probably generally a little more picky about the location that they... <laughs> Engage I, in that type of activity? I did come across this. Okay. There was a 2013 study that showed the couple's selection of rooms at love hotels was made by the woman 90% of the time. <laughs> the dude's like, whatever, get yeah. a bed. I don't care. We can get in the back seat of a car. Yeah, the It woman's doesn't matter like, to me. Mm, uh, this one looks pretty. So yeah. they, they figured that out and they were like, yeah, all right, we'll make all the ones the women like. Pretty smart. Yeah. And maybe because of that, a lot of these modern love hotels have beautiful rooms, like way better looking rooms than you'd find at any normal hotel. Oh, yeah. We're going to get into it. I really want to visit a lot of these places. So as I mentioned, the heyday for love hotels was in the early 2000s. I saw an estimated 30,000. I think Paul, you said 37,000 yeah. in 2006. But in 2010... Stricter limitations were put on love hotels with an amendment to that law we talked about, the businesses affecting public morals regulation law. And this new law further blurred the line between love hotels and regular hotels. So that's why these days you'll see all those different names for these types of places. I listed them in the intro. You got boutique hotels, fashion hotels, leisure hotels, Etc. <laughs> leisure hotel. Why does it sound dirty to me? If some some dude is like, I'm going to the leisure hotel this week, and I'd be like, this dude's up to no good. Yeah. Is that just me? I don't know. Where am I getting that from? I don't know. In in humans in their leisure time, <laughs> I suppose they get up to some, you know, naughty yeah, yeah. stuff. You're right. You're right. People being people. 
You know, these days you also see a lot of love hotels that almost try to downplay the association with sex. I saw places that called themselves wellness clubs. <laughs> and their advertisements make them look like spas. You know, there's no indication that this is a place to have sex, but they'll even have saunas and stuff. But you know what it's really for. And we'll tell you pretty soon how to figure out what this place is actually about, right? There's actually a place I'm going to bring up later that is like still a love hotel in some ways, but it's also kid friendly. What? Yeah, uh, we'll get there. All right. So these days, uh, love hotels seem to be declining a bit for various reasons. One reason might be those regulations. They keep changing the laws and making things difficult, you know? But also, Japan has an aging population that isn't helping. Less young people means less customers for mm-hmm. love hotels. Yep. More neats or hikikomori. I, I don't know how significant that is. No. Probably not a huge percentage of the population. I don't know. Beyond that, there's a whole bunch of what have been termed like herbivorous men in Japan who just like don't even try to like hit on women and just have given up on ever having a relationship. Yeah. I don't know if that's like a massive percentage of the population, but it it's apparently like a growing group. Yeah. I, I mean, feel like that's happening here too. I feel like we're like 20 years behind the Japanese trends and this sort of stuff here. I was about to say that. Like, I feel like that's maybe a global problem in the developed world is like romantic relationships take a lot of work and online dating sucks. Yeah. And there are so many other ways to satisfy yourself in that area, you know? And now, like maybe like, relationships just aren't worth it anymore. Everyone needs to have like a full time job to survive, and everyone's like busy and stressed and tired. And like, yeah. it's hard to have like the energy and time and money left to like have a good relationship outside of that. Yeah. The world we live in just doesn't really support healthy relationships you could say is that going too far no it doesn't support forming a family i'll say that for sure yeah all the places like the united states that don't have any mandatory parental leave from work that's messed up man yeah that's crazy (laughs) how like how why would you want to have a baby right they make it so difficult to survive with babies the priority of our culture is clearly industry and capital. I was talking to my coworkers that have kids about the cost of childcare. Holy crap, Paul. <laughs> don't even go there. How, I don't know how people survive. Exactly. As a single person, I'm not rolling in cash. I'm like, yeah. okay, but I can't imagine having like a kid and a spouse to support. I'd feel incredibly poor, I feel like. Yeah. I guess that's why I'm single. When I'm single, I'm middle class. If I have a family and kids, I'm poor. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway. How did we get here? Let's get let's get back to love hotels. This is a fun, lighthearted, sexy episode, right? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So let me get to my emoji facts here. It's emoji time. So Paul, you mentioned that there is a love hotel emoji. Yes. It was created in 2010 as a part of Unicode 6.0. Okay. And I had not heard of this before I did my research, but if you type in Love Hotel on an iPhone anyway, it'll, the little emoji will pop up. (laughs) And it looks, it looks to me like a hotel with a big heart on the top. And then there's an H inside the heart. So, okay, Love Hotel. That totally makes sense. Yeah. If you interpret that H as hotel. Instead of hospital. Love hospital. Exactly. I think this is hilarious. In the West, since most people have never heard of a love hotel, a lot of people think that that emoji is a hospital. Even like big businesses and politicians make this mistake. And I saw a lot of hilarious (laughs) tweets where politicians were using that emoji to symbolize hospital. I got to look that up. Yeah. (laughs) But in Japan, that sounds like a super useful emoji. One character and the person you're texting knows exactly what you want to do. Visiting all the children at the Love Hotel today. Like, Senator, what are, what are you <laughs> tweeting? 
That's messed up, Paul. That's messed up. <laughs> Senator. I didn't tweet that. <laughs> I know what a love hotel is, Jason. I'm not I'm glad, ignorant. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I get a love hotel text from you, I'll know exactly how to interpret it. Then I'm definitely going to start sending that emoji <laughs> to you. <laughs> Like, which one? Tell me where. Give me a time and a place. I'm going to send that emoji with an address and be like, we're staying here <laughs> April 22nd to 23rd. Are we done with history now? No. Oh, okay. You're still going. <laughs> uh, oh, I just had one more thing about how love hotels exist all over the world in some form. Yes. Uh, in some places, they're more or less accepted by society. In some places, they're seen as really seedy and dirty and undesirable places to have in your neighborhood sounds like a fun place what places that think of them that way yeah yeah you know different cultures have different values some of them are very puritanical yeah some some value having a good time more than others exactly and in a lot of places they're really highly regulated because of their potential facilitation of Illegal sex industry stuff. Sure. And we have more about controversies later on. So, Paul, what types of places are Love Hotels located? If you're looking for a place to do the dirty, is that what people say? (laughs) Uh, About 20 years ago, maybe. (laughs) All right. What do people say now? What are the What are the kids saying? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not a kid anymore. All right, no, no making I got, making I Whoopi. <laughs> That's from like 1970s game shows, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those shows were too hilarious, though. <laughs> I think people don't have those hangups today. What? I don't think people need to. Uh, say things like make the whoopee people are just more straight to the point these days Mm. i think the kids are like hey want to fuck i don't like that (laughs) i don't know that just it's not romantic yeah i don't know i may maybe i just made that up should i be beeping words in this or since we had that uh now this warning at the beginning this is an 18 plus episode all right we're safe sounds good we're safe i can drop an f-bomb or two fuck Doesn't feel good. (laughs) Sorry, I just wanted to get one in there. (laughs) So, Paul, where where are Love Hotels located? (laughs) Often uh, places easily gotten to near train stations. They might be concentrated in certain city districts. Um, Red light districts, perhaps. Yep. In smaller towns, they might be near the edge of town, near a major road or highway. And I get the impression that these places are usually grouped together. Yeah, there'll be like little districts and cities where you can find clumps of them. Yeah, you can go for a little stroll, pick out the one that catches your eye. Yeah. A lot of them aren't as like crazily designed anymore, but there's still ways to tell if Mm -hmm. it's a love hotel or not. Yeah. But some of them still do have crazy designs, right? Like you can tell from the outside a lot of the time. From the look of yeah. the place. Big neon signs. There'll be hearts probably on it. They might be painted pink. It doesn't necessarily look like a normal hotel. I saw one that looks like a giant boat. Yeah, yeah. The one I remember seeing in Japan my first time was like a big corner building and it was all painted pink and it had like hearts on it. And I think it had like little almost like little Care Bear <laughs> designs on it or something. Okay. Uh, but then it had a big sign out front with another way you can tell. It had like a, a rate for an hour or two, and it had a rate for a night. Most hotels don't have that. Yeah, this seemed like the biggest cue to me that you're looking at a love hotel is if you see a sign that says there are different rates for a rest or a stay, that's your big clue that this is a love hotel. Yeah. Because a rest is code for a short, sexy stay. You're not spending the whole night. Yeah, usually about one to three hours that you can rent at a discounted rate. Yep. And uh, the entrances to these types of places are designed to be very discreet. 
so people don't feel weird about going inside. Even the parking lots might be hidden, so you can drive up in your dark tinted windows and sneak your way into the, the back entrance. I saw one picture of the outside of a love hotel and it had like curtains hanging down almost over the parking spots. Hmm. So you couldn't see anything above like the hood of the car. And I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. Everyone was like backing in. Then you could get out. No one could see you. But I was like, your license plate is like right there. It's like the one thing. And I'd be like, I thought you were going to say that they were long enough to cover up the license. No, no. License plates just right there. So I mean, like not many people are going to know your license plate, but. Some dude's like trying to cheat on his wife or something. She walks by and like, wait, what? Well, what's the point of the curtain then? Just so people can make out in their cars? No, because like when you stand up to get out of your car, no one oh, can see you. Okay, you can like sure. walk in through the back entrance and have discretion that way. All right. Also looking at these places from the outside, you might notice there are very few windows or maybe really small windows. Yeah. It's all about privacy in these places. Though, if it's tall enough, like looking out over the city might be kind of fun. What? Wouldn't it be nice having a view from a love hotel, you know? I mean, there are other places to get a view. Why does the view matter from there? I don't know. I guess it's a kink. Oh, you just like doing it up high? Are you part of the 10th, what is it, mile high club? (laughs) Uh, No. I'd feel bad like doing that on a public flight. Yeah, that's like, not cool. that's not that's not fair to like the people around me. I don't know how people. I mean, the logistics of it. Even those bathrooms are so tiny. Yeah, if I had an opportunity on a private jet, yeah, I'd go for it. But I've only ever flown coach, and it ain't happening, coach, unless you're crazy. We have a really big blanket. <laughs> anyway. I know people do it. I know people do it. People get caught doing it. Yeah. Anyway, small windows. Small I windows. Love hotels. So what are you going to see when you walk in, Paul? Oftentimes, you're going to see a very well-decorated lobby. But what you're not going to see is a lot of people. It's very uh, like isolated from staff. A lot of the places have a big electronic board where you can go look and see what room is available. And the rooms that are available will be lit up so you can see a picture of the room. You can see a description. You can see a price. You select that room. You either pay with a credit card there or you can like take it to a window that's like frosted glass or something so they can't see you and you can't see them and you pay there. There were even some older hotels that are still around that have like a little tube system like at the drive through at the bank where you could put money in a tube and it goes shoo, shoo, up through the ceiling to a room somewhere where they can't see you. I always love those things. So depending on the hotel, if it's a themed hotel, the entryway might be lavishly decorated. I've also heard of things such as like a wall of like sex toys right when you walk in to set the mood. I saw they have sex toy vending machines in the lobby sometimes. That makes sense. Yeah. So let's say you rent a room, you step inside, it's going to blow your mind, man. I mean, well, so less expensive places. You can get places that look pretty much like any other hotel room, right? Yeah. But if you're willing to spend a little bit more, you're going to get these themed rooms, perhaps, and all sorts of sexy amenities, like huge beds. That's pretty standard, I think. You need a big bed. Yes, yes. Rotating beds, perhaps. Like I said, I need to do that. There might be mirrors on the ceiling. That's kind of cool. There might be a giant TV. I think that's pretty standard too with uh, access to streaming all sorts of things, probably a wide selection of porn. Yes. Karaoke machines. I love that. That that is a sexy amenity. Yeah. You know? (laughs) Having a good time. Nothing gets me in the mood like a little nude karaoke. You know this about me, Paul. I've never tried that, but that actually sounds kind of fun. It is a cool idea. I mean, the rooms are already soundproof, you know? Yeah. So why not? Why not sing? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, lots of artwork in the nicer rooms, like really unique designs and paintings. 
There might be video game systems. Yeah. It's kind of cool. The lighting is often an emphasis. Like a lot of great lighting designs with colors and dimness and neon maybe. Mood lighting is important. Yeah. The rooms focus a lot on the mood. Like a normal hotel room you go in, it's going to be white walls. It's going to be a bed with a funky multicolored spread on it. (laughs) And that's like it. A couple little square furnitures but you go to a love hotel at least any of the like halfway decent ones it's going to be like bright light colors well decorated paintings they're really cool places Mm -hmm. i saw a lot of massage chairs in there yeah that's pretty awesome yeah a jacuzzi perhaps i saw there might even be anime themed rooms yeah, fantasy rooms that look like dungeons. There are places that specialize in S and M type stuff. Yeah, some of them get into it. Yeah, you can even get like S and M gear. You know, whips and chains or whatever. You might find a menu there. A lot of these places do room service. I heard that some of them even sell food at low prices because if people eat and drink, they're more likely to stay longer. And then they get the extra room fare from them. But again, even when they deliver the food, you don't need to actually look anyone in the eye. They might deliver it to like a little adjoined room, you know, separated from your main room. So yeah, you can you might go out there and grab it. Also, find a menu where you can order costumes for cosplay, so you could get a nurse outfit or whatever, all sorts of odd ones, and you could often pick those up through a little cubby too. We don't have to actually see anybody i saw a place that actually had an in-room vending machine for costumes or sexy underwear (laughs) things like that in-room vending machine and it sounds like free condoms is pretty standard yes which would make sense so the amenities are actually geared towards the fornication that happens in the rooms like the bathrooms you just used the word fornication i did i did Because it covers a wide range of activities, and people can do all sorts of things in these rooms. Sure. Anyways, like the bathrooms are usually well stocked, like shampoo, body lotion, body wash, all sorts of stuff so people can thoroughly clean themselves. Also, I heard that some places offer unscented shampoos and soaps so that you wouldn't leave smelling the same. If two people use the same shampoo and like went back to work or something and be like, why do these two people smell the same? Wow. Or you went home or whatever. So you wouldn't, people wouldn't be able to tell like you just took a shower necessarily. That's very thoughtful. Yeah. Hmm. I heard, I saw one place that even left like a small vibrator as like a free gift. Cool. In the room. Nice. Another thing you might see. Is brochures or magazines for delivery health girls. Did you see this, Paul? Uh, yes. So delivery health, this is another one of those things that's commonly shortened in Japanese. They call them daddy head girls. Escorts, essentially. You can order women to your room. But if you're a foreigner, you're probably going to have some trouble finding an escort agency that's going to do business with you. And you might be thinking, wait, isn't this illegal? Like, prostitution is illegal, right? Well, in Japan, actually, the only sex service that's illegal is vaginal intercourse. Pretty much everything else up to that point is legal. And if you walk around Tokyo at night, you might be approached by people advertising these services. That happened to me. Yeah? Yeah. Wow. They thought they could get you. They didn't. (laughs) Good choice, I would say. I'm taken. That's what I told her. (laughs) Aw, that's sweet. So, Paul, what are the rates going to look like in these types of places? So, obviously, it depends on the type of place you go. They can range in quality quite a bit. But I saw that for a rest rate, you're often looking around like 20 bucks. 20 US dollars. And rest is somewhere between like one to three hours. Yes. So it's not like 
wildly expensive to just pop in there for a couple hours. Um, you're looking like three to four times that amount if you're looking for the stay rate, which is the overnight rate. So like 60 to 80 bucks, which is not a bad price for a hotel. Yeah. So love hotels tend to be less expensive. Although inside they're like kind of nice. So it's pretty good bang for your buck generally, I think. Yeah. I mean, the main issue, like the reason you wouldn't want to stay there long term is that once you leave, you can't get back in. Yes. Like you don't leave luggage in there and go do stuff during the day and then come back. You can't book three nights at a love hotel. You need to like come back and rebuy the room every time you want to get back in. Right. You can't leave your luggage there. So they're not designed, they're not set up for that. Mm-hmm. But if you just need one night to spend somewhere, it's a very reasonable price for a nice room generally. Yep. Weekends are going to be more expensive than weekdays due to demand. Yeah. Makes sense. And at non-peak times, there might be something called service time or free time which is basically where you get all you can rest time for a flat fee. Yeah. So like weekday mornings, not a lot of people are going to love hotels in the middle of the week, in the morning. So maybe you can stay as long as you want between like 1 a.m. and 11 a.m. for 30 or 40 bucks, something like that. And if you do want to stay overnight, often you can't stay overnight until at least 10 p.m. Like you can't just come in at noon and stay overnight. But if you come in at 10 p.m. or later, you can stay overnight. And they tend to have kind of later checkout times, too. Like, you might not have to leave until 10, 11 a.m. the next morning because, again, they're not super busy in the mornings. But, yeah, so it's not something you can just, like, book as a normal hotel. I'm going to check in at 6 p.m. and I'm going to go out for dinner. I'm going to come back. I'm going to sleep. It doesn't work like that. Right. So doing this research, I'm sure we came across uh, some interesting love hotels, right? Oh, yeah. I need to visit some of these places. Okay, okay. What's on your list? Well, there's a place called Hotel Sara. Hotel Sara, S-A-R-A. This is a chain. They actually have multiple locations. Uh, The most accessible location from Tokyo is in Sumida City, which is kind of on the east side of Tokyo. And you can even check out their rooms on their website. They have like 360 degree photo type things. Yeah, I went there. What? Yeah. Oh, the website you mean? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I saw, I saw the website. I saw this place. Okay. One room that stuck out to me that's apparently a, a fairly common theme for love hotels in general is a school room room. Ah, yes. So they have desks and a chalkboard. It looks just like a classroom. And I'm pretty sure you can rent like schoolgirl outfits too. I'm sure. Uh, Another room looked just like a train car, like you mentioned earlier, Paul. They got like the luggage rack up on top with the little rings hanging down that you grab on. I saw a lot of places actually that had that type of room. Yeah. One that really stood out to me here was the Heian room. Mm. It was designed Heian period style, but it was like the red of like a Shinto shrine A lot of like wood and red and black. And it just looked super cool. It was like very like traditional Japanese looking room. It looked great. I saw a lot of cool color schemes at that place. There was one room that was like all white and pink. There was one that's just tons of gold everywhere. One had a lot of silver everywhere. Looked pretty classy. They have a Sakura room there. And they have a room for the seasons. There's a winter room, an autumn room, a summer room. Just like tons of cool designs, and they all look really cool. Awesome. So actually, just down the street from that hotel, there's another one called Balion. Did you see that? I did. That one's pretty famous, apparently. It offers an authentic Bali experience. If you're not aware bali is an island in indonesia so you can get a really like tropical island type of feel here i saw a lot of like gauzy flowy drape type things tropical flowers reminded me of like hawaii kind of you know yeah yeah definitely a tropical theme i liked 
in Osaka Hotel Ikutama Love. It's this huge Roman temple exterior with the big columns outside and then like a second layer that like goes in a little bit and more columns. And it was just like a stunning building from the outside. And then inside, all the rooms are brightly colored and like really well decorated in modern designs. It just looked super cool. And it was one of those fancy places where you get like a free bottle of champagne and flowers in your room every time you go in. Classy. Yeah. (laughs) Paul, did you see this hotel? It's based in Narita. It's called Hotel Blonde Chapel Christmas. I did. That looks so, I don't know. I don't don't know what the word is for it. It's Christmas themed and it's open all year round. So whenever you feel that, you know, feel like getting in a Christmas type of mood, you can go here. They got a giant Santa outside and everything. And let me read a review. I found a review that I thought was entertaining. Okay. We booked the hotel thinking it was a normal hotel themed in Christmas. (laughs) <laughs> but it came out that this hotel is intended to have sex. It is built in a way so faces of customers are never seen by the staff unless you don't speak Japanese and need to order by phone. There are many kinds of toys and protection for a night full of fun, even a menu to get your own costume for the night. In any case, whether you wanted sex or not, the room is so comfortable and big and has a very good price I will repeat. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's They so showed awesome. up not even knowing it was a love hotel, and they're like, I'm going to go back. This place is awesome. They still loved it. <laughs> yeah. There was an icy blue-themed room that I thought looked spectacular there. Ooh, like the, uh, the Ice Kings uh, room, like that. What's the Ice Kings? I've been watching Adventure Time lately. Okay. You're not familiar? No. Oh, man, Adventure Time is great. Okay. The Ice King is funny. He's he's Yia's favorite. Oh, by the way, my fiance is named Yia, and I asked her if I could say her name on the podcast, and she said yes. Have you never before? I feel like I asked her, and she, uh, I don't know. Okay. But recently, I got permission, so now I'm saying it. Yia, Y-I-A, is her name. So if I refer to Yia in the future, that's who I'm talking about. I didn't tell her that the Love Hotels episode was going to be the first episode where I mentioned her name, but <laughs> but I also got her to agree to go to a Love Hotel with me. I can't wait. Oh, yeah? Yeah. All right. You also told that uh, cute story about turning the girl down. I'm taken. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Got any other fun ones, Paul? So I mentioned something earlier about a hotel that was like kind of a Love Hotel and not a Love Hotel, right? So I was looking up love hotels. And I kept coming across this Hotel Arita Dinosaur. Dinosaur. Yes. And it's one of these robot hotels where the reception desk is manned by two animatronic dinosaurs. But it's not the Henna Hotel where they have those? I mean, we already talked about a place where they have those dinosaurs. I think it's, it's owned by the same company or it's that same hotel. I don't know if there's one or two. But this company apparently runs a bunch of hotels with robots. But so I kept hearing it described as like a love hotel. But then I thought that too. Like I thought I've seen this place before, right? So I looked into it more and people went there and they said there were condoms in their room. And you could get like the three hour times. But there's also a playground on the roof for children. So it's like not an 18 plus hotel, but it also like is, it seems to be one of those weird hotels that's like floating in between or something. Okay. But yeah, there's like robot dinosaurs. I think one of the rooms even had a dinosaur in it. You could like ride. It was interesting. Pretty sexy. Yeah. All right. I found a place in Atsugi City, in Kanagawa Prefecture, there's a place called Hotel Togenkyo Isehara. Does this sound familiar? No. Its theme is Bushido oh, and traditional really? samurai culture. 
So the building actually looks like, it almost looks like a Japanese castle. And the rooms are kind of based on that traditional aesthetic. There's a lot of white and wood, but it also has kind of modern Western amenities too. Look pretty fun. Just that type of atmosphere, you know. They even had like bamboo out in the garden or something. Okay. It looked fun. I don't know. I'm into that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, in Niigata, there's a place called Hotel Us Keibajo. Okay. They have some cool themed rooms based around cosplay and role playing. So they have a school classroom. We already talked about that. They have a hospital exam room. And I think I saw that there's like a famous Japanese porn star that had filmed in this room or something. Okay. There's a construction site, which I thought was interesting. It doesn't interesting. come to mind as like a sexy kind of atmosphere. Interesting. But they have a Japanese prison. Okay. And a log cabin room. Okay. Uh, okay, a log Cozy cabin. Log cabin. Uh, I, can, I like I that. I can see that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. It's just you and me in the wilderness. You and me? If, if we go there together. All right. I'm down. <laughs> one other one caught my eye. Hotel Renaza in Kobe. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It seems to be like some sort of take on Renaissance, but they don't spell it like that. Mm. But there's glow-in-the-dark sea murals in some rooms. Sea murals? Yeah, with like dolphins and fish and stuff. And they like glow in the lights. It's really cool. There's indoor and outdoor jacuzzis in some of the rooms. And there's a fetish room that has like a full human-sized like dog cage, (laughs) basically. Wow. That's also like... I got a glass top on it and you can use it as a table. Wow. So you could like eat on top of it while someone's locked inside of it. I don't know. Awesome. What's some, some kind of power play that's going to do for somebody out there. Isn't it sad that America is so prudish? Why can't we have fetish rooms? You know, right. There's a sex swing. There's like wall straps to like strap someone spread Eagle to the wall. I always wanted to try one of those swings. That sounds interesting. Yeah, right? That does sound kind of cool. Yeah. There's also one room randomly with a really big Snoopy mural. Okay. So I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, when you mentioned the sea mural thing, it reminded me, I don't have the name of this place, but I saw one that was like Little Mermaid themed. They had the clamshell bed, but then they even had like Ariel and... Sebastian and stuff like on the walls. That's kind of weird. Yeah. Interesting. Hey, man. There's definitely some fanfics about Disney characters out there. That's for sure. We don't put down people's kinks, right? People can be into whatever they want to be into. You're right. I just get surprised sometimes. Like the fish? Yo, the fish? Whatever. Dolphins are very sexual creatures from what I hear. Uh... I don't have a response to that. I mean, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. You've read the articles. I've I've heard the same things. (laughs) You got any more crazy love hotels for us, Jason? No, that's it for me. All right. Well, I guess there's the next thing to talk about. Controversies. Yeah. And all these crazy laws that keep popping up around these places. So, obviously, the biggest issue that people have with love hotels is their connection to the sex industry, right? Yep. Which itself is, of course, controversial. Some people are just worried about moral decline. Some people actually think that the sex industry is partially to blame for lower birth rates in Japan. I don't know. I Come mean, on. The sex industry has Come been around on. since the beginning of humanity. It's hard to pin the problems of modern society on that, right? If people can be having like relationship sex, they're less likely to go have sex worker sex. Like it's filling the void that's not being met somewhere else. I think. I don't know. Yeah. But so this is maybe a valid criticism is that the privacy offered at love hotels makes it easier for people to commit crimes. Even beyond 
prostitution, murder and extortion are not super uncommon in love hotels, apparently. Okay. The level of privacy also makes these places accessible to minors, so they can go do things that people don't really want minors doing, generally. Yeah, you probably don't want minors going in there. You probably don't want minors renting any hotel room, right? (laughs) Probably. And a lot of people just don't like the fact that prostitution happens in general, so they want to minimize the places that that can happen. But that just ends up making it more dangerous, doesn't it? Yes, and I have a big long thing about how prohibition is never the solution to societal problems. Yeah. Well, let me let me work my way there. <laughs> um, so, okay, remember we talked about that 2010 crackdown on the industry? They changed some laws and stuff? Yeah. Apparently that is due to the connection between love hotels and prostitution, especially juvenile prostitution. Well, that's not cool. Yeah. So with these laws from 2010, the idea is that love hotels and normal hotels operate under different licenses and different sets of laws. And love hotels aren't allowed to operate in certain areas, like around schools, for example. But if a love hotel doesn't look like a love hotel, it can be licensed as a normal hotel and they can avoid some of those restrictions that are placed on the love hotel classification right yeah so it all comes down to like a saving face thing ah people can go there and have sex as long as it's discreet right Right. it's just got to be discreet enough yeah you just can't be obvious that it's a love hotel so that's why a lot of places these days don't call themselves love hotels yeah and actually about half of the love hotels in japan are believed to be in this category in the not-quite-love-hotels category. So it seems like the new laws aren't really helping a lot. It's just they're forcing the industry to kind of find ways to work around them, you know? Yep. And the love hotel owners say that it's ridiculous anyway because it's not like the sex trade is going to stop. It's just going to get pushed further underground. People are going to start going to internet cafes or normal hotel rooms if love hotels aren't available. So, you know, it's a tricky problem that they're trying to solve. And this is my soapbox time right here. Go for it. I think that's one of the main arguments for the legalization and regulation of sex services because you're never going to get rid of prostitution entirely. It's impossible. That industry has always existed and it always will. And by forcing sex workers to operate in secret, all it does is put them in danger, okay? Sex workers are abused and murdered all the time, and they have nowhere to go for help because what they do for a living is illegal. And some crappy people, in my opinion, might say, well, who cares? They put themselves in that position. They deserve what they get. That's, that's what a shitty person says, I think. Right, Paul? I mean, it's what a wrong person says. Hopefully they're right about other things. It's victim but blaming, Paul. Yeah, it's not right. They need to rethink that. People are going to do it, right? So, like, for example, if you drive it all underground, then anything goes because you're already committing enough crimes that could get you sent to jail for a long time. Well, what's one more crime? What if I bring in a minor now? I'm already committing all these crimes. If you have it as a sanctioned and regulated thing, you're already making a bunch of money. But, you know, if the age of majority is 20 in Japan, oh, if I bring in an 18 or 19 year old now and I get busted, I go to jail, I lose my business, I lose everything. They're so much less likely to do it. And if you ever find somebody breaking the rules like that, you toss them in jail, you take away their business, you don't let them ever work in that industry again, and you clean it up and you have a much better chance of having less people exploited and abused and hurt, as you said. Thank you. Off the soapbox. Well, let me step on the soapbox for yeah, another you, minute. You're back up for you. Because I want to bring this to, it's, it's the same argument for the legalization of drugs, okay? Powerful and brutal drug cartels exist, not despite drug prohibition, but because of it. The same way that America's alcohol prohibition in the 1920s gave rise to all sorts of 
organized crime and government corruption and stuff. Prohibition is just a bad idea. It puts people in danger and it empowers dangerous people. So my point is, regulation is better for people and for society than outright bans. 100% right. In my humble opinion. 100% right. Definitely in our nation's history, that's for sure. We've tried prohibition. It didn't work. And it we've made also things been worse. Uh, fighting a war on drugs for the last 50 years. Oh, man, don't get me started. That's got us absolutely nowhere except the largest prison population in the entire world. It is absolutely disturbing what percentage of the world's prison population is in America. Yep. yep. It's, it's disgusting we that will, a society can be allowed to operate that way. We lock away more of our own than anybody, and it's not even close. Oh, man, this lighthearted episode. Now I'm all angry. Yep, yep. <laughs> so a couple other things I have to mention. One is that in 2018, there was a law preventing discrimination at hotels based upon sexual orientation or gender identity. So it is technically legal for gay couples to go to a love hotel. But I've seen from people's experiences that a lot of them will still turn you away. Like if two men try to go into a love hotel, eh, there's, there's a chance they're going to come out and say, no, you can't come in. No, no two guys. Who's paying that close attention? Are you saying they have like cameras in the lobby so they can watch who's getting in there? Yes, they 100% do. Okay. And this was happening at least anecdotally from the people I saw. It was more likely to happen at the nicer places, the more expensive places. They were going to come say, no. The wow. cheaper places, they're like, yeah, whatever, dude. Let's get in the room. Huh. I didn't see that. So That's it's illegal, but it's not really being enforced. Wow. Also, in a little more lighthearted way, have you heard about the Nintendo Love Hotel conspiracy? Uh-uh. So there's this long-running conspiracy that Nintendo was involved in the Love Hotel industry at some point in the past, like, 60s 70s ish and this rumor just keeps going but people have like searched through a whole bunch of like nintendo's past financial documents and things and no one could find any evidence that they actually owned any love hotels but maybe they cooked the books or maybe it's just an urban legend but a lot of people believe it all right All right, well, if you would like to visit a love hotel, I suggest you Google it because there are a ton to choose from and you can probably find one in whatever city you're planning on staying in if you're visiting Japan. And I saw they can even be booked on the big booking sites. Yeah, yeah, they're, a lot of them are online now. Yeah, kind of surprised that they take reservations even. I thought I saw somewhere say that they didn't take reservations, but... I don't think they used to because... Like, you never knew exactly when a room would be free. Yeah. Because people might stay longer or whatever. Yeah, and they're just trying to squeeze in as many people as possible. Yeah, you know? yeah. But maybe they like booking the overnights. Like, yeah, if you're going to book from, like, 10 p.m. to the next morning and pay them 80 bucks, maybe they'll take that and they'll just... Whoever comes in, they'll be like, you have to be out by 8 o'clock. Yeah. I have a couple places in Tokyo where you can find a collection of love hotels. Okay. One is in Shibuya. There's a, an area called Dogenzaka. The central part of this neighborhood is actually known as Love Hotel Hill. <laughs> yeah. But I saw that these are generally pretty plain. They're not the really fancy, crazy ones. Kabukicho in Shinjuku is another place you'll find a few. And I stayed in Kabukicho, so I must have seen some love hotels. I just probably didn't really notice them. Yep. Around Ikibukuro Station, there's supposedly over 80 love hotels. If you go out the north exit, the east exit, or the west exit, you will find love hotels. Wait, north, east, or west? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, I do remember I stayed, and I know you stayed, at the same place I stayed, just west of Ikibukuro Station, and I do remember seeing a lot of like 
hostess clubs and I don't know, yeah. a- advertisements for places with pretty girls on the signs, basically. Yeah. We just didn't know what to look for necessarily at the time. Yeah. But I mean, if we looked at the signs now, we'd be like, oh, two rates. Oh, there's a heart there at the 100% Love Hotel. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty fun. <laughs> Well, that's all I got. How about you, Paul? That's it. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed learning about sexy hotels. We'll be back with another family-friendly episode next time. Yep. Well, if you want to find us online, you can do that at our website, sightseeingjapanpodcast.com. We're also on Facebook, if you're a Facebook-type person, facebook.com slash sightseeingjapanpodcast. Paul, what are we talking about next time? On the next episode, we will be discussing Japan's four seasons. They take the seasons very seriously there, and uh, a lot of their culture is inspired by the changing of the seasons. This is another episode requested by Paul, and I'm less sure about this one than I was about the Love Hotel one. (laughs) You sound so negative (laughs) right now. No one's excited now for this episode. It's going to be great. Don't worry. Jace is wrong. I hope you're right. I hope it's a fun one. I don't know. I guess I'm just not I'm not clear on where the where the borders are on this topic. Like I understand that makes you uncomfortable, but I feel like once you start researching, you're going to find so much stuff that you're going to be like, I don't know where to draw the line of all this great stuff I have. We'll see. <laughs> Join us next time to see if Paul had a good idea or not. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.